I'd like to welcome you to the first episode of What the Tech Podcast. Now, as a host of your new favorite technology podcast, I'd like to ask you to subscribe and boop the like button to show your support for all technology enthusiasts everywhere and for my first guest. Today, I'm blessed with the opportunity to hear an amazing founder story. He is the CEO and founder of a new metaverse platform, and the company's objective is to deliver a completely new experience that really inspires engagement in the metaverse. They are working uh, with industry-leading companies and communities like Slack and Zapier and Grammarly to achieve this goal. And according to G2, the company has made the list of top providers of metaverse solutions for corporate and community outings. Now, I'm excited to learn more about this innovative platform and how it's actually changing the way we interact with each other in the digital world. So if you're not geeking out just yet, just wait until you meet my next guest. Let's go. Yuri, it's so great to have you on the show. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Uh, hi, Troy. It's my pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, so greetings from San Francisco. That's not a fancy background wallpaper. <laughs> <laughs> That's the real city just behind me. And uh, I'm so grateful to be here. Yeah, grateful to have this conversation. So thanks for taking the time. You know, I, I read something interesting about you, uh, which I found peculiar considering Maybe I just don't know anything about the Ukraine. Maybe I don't know enough about the Ukraine, but I read you're a huge fan of barbecue. And uh, <laughs> here in the South, Yuri, I don't know if you know this, if you spent much time uh, kind of traveling much, but um, here in the South, uh, they consider barbecue one thing, and it's pig. Like, if it's not pig, it's not barbecue. Now, I'm from Northern California. Yeah, I know, uh -huh. right? <laughs> I'm from Northern California, and anything you put on a barbecue is a barbecue. It could be a hamburger, it could be a hot dog, it could be ribs, it could, anything is barbecue. So I'm curious on your stance, since you're not technically from the U.S., what's your best barbecue, uh, in your opinion? Okay, that, that's a very great <laughs> kickoff question for a <laughs> show, uh, and that would be my favorite questions of all shows probably so yeah uh, in ukraine uh barbecue in fact is considered uh so there is the middle east way to make meat which is called shashlik so basically okay. it's like a kebab but in kebab you have a grounded meat while in shashlik you have the just huge chunks of meat put on the steel stuff and then put over coals and uh, this is the most traditional way to make barbecue in Ukraine. And in 99% of cases, uh, it should be pork. But Middle Eastern guys, they would prefer beef, lamb, uh, and mixture of those. Uh, so for me, barbecue is still the process of when you are making something on the open heat, uh, when you're grilling something. So I, I hope that that won't be an issue for me to enter the southern part of the United States. And I would really love to to try all the delicious stuff that's been prepared there. But yeah, but let's look at this wider. Yeah, so I so it's also a battle of East versus West here. Uh, so I'll give you a quick, uh, you know, I guess purview. If you ever come to North Carolina... The Western barbecue has tomato sauce in it. The, the Eastern barbecue only has like vinegar based. And so you've got to partake of both um, because they're both excellent. Um, but there's definitely opinions in the state of North Carolina on which one's better. So, just so you know. <laughs> uh, th th thank you. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of, to discover. And uh, I, I would be keen on... Uh, actually figuring out what, what the best place to live in the United States uh, according to the barbecue, <laughs> to the taste of barbecue. Yeah. Well, you pick the most expensive place. So, uh, <laughs> you know, you have a lot of places uh, that you can explore. But, you know, we know there's a tech hub there. So it makes all the sense in the world. So let's, let's jump in here. Uh, and thanks for answering that question. And I'm actually more intrigued uh, to try some Ukrainian barbecue now. <laughs> Oh, um, so do you know if if we can 
disregard all the political correctness, the Ukrainian barbecue right now is where people are drilling Russian invaders back and forth, and that's what <laughs> that's what's happening Russian, in Ukraine right now. Russian invaders, yeah, yeah. Well, they kind of deserve it. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but like you know, uh, they I, it's so tragic what's going on over there. But you know, anything the Ukrainians can do to protect themselves and uh, I'm all for it, man. I was all for like whatever it takes, and uh, you know. So, um, anyways, um, so uh, speaking of that, you you actually before you came here, you were you were actually I think you were still there, right? Yes, dealing yes. with that. Uh, I, I want to hear about that. Yeah. I actually was going to ask something about that later, but I'd love to hear kind of like let's start off with that. Where your journey getting here, man? What what does the last two years look like for you? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, two years, uh, they went incredibly fast because I was, and I'm still running a tech company called Party Space. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we help companies to conduct social events in browser for their employees in a 3D environment with the Odin video communication. It works really well. Uh, and we are like team of 34, we are actively hiring, drawing, etc. But the beginning of this year started for me in Las Vegas. I flew there uh, just before the CES conference and I was planning on my relocation to LA. Uh, I thought that would be the best place for a startup founder as me to be and I uh, spent almost the whole January uh, around LA. Uh, then I returned in Ukraine uh, to actually develop the contingency action plans because people were still concerned Russia would invade us. I was the, the biggest denier of the potential of war. Uh, as a operational person, I I thought like, okay, they, they are not that crazy to uh, invade Ukraine uh, in other, like, in this pleasant way, uh, I was expecting that to be. Maybe, maybe they will start like more provocations. Maybe they hit up the situation on east, but not a full scale war against Ukraine. Uh, but we have we have developed all the contingency action plans, uh, prepared people. Uh, our lawyer conducted a few trainings on what people should do when everything starts. So we have invested in security, and uh, then uh, in February. Uh, <laughs> One of our angel investors actually made me a New Year gift. He bought me a semi-automatic rifle. And it was like almost a joke. Uh, but he said, like, it, I hope it won't help you. You won't need it. But uh, maybe you rather have it with you. And yeah. uh, two days after that, uh, it was February 24th. And uh, everything changed. We, yeah, we woke up at 6 a.m. Uh, my dad was calling my girlfriend's number and he said, like, Russian tanks are heading towards Kharkiv. Uh, please evacuate yourself because we were on the left bank of Dnieper River uh, until they blow up all the bridges. Please go to my place, which seemed like a much safer location at that moment. Uh, but the location where we had it, from my dad, uh, his house, uh, that place is located five miles away from Bucha and uh, is very close to the most important uh, freeway between like Kiev and Lviv and actually like the most important logistical road towards the West. And Russians tried everything to get there and... Uh, Actually, like our village was the front line, and they haven't advanced further. Uh, they tried to encircle that, move from different flanks, but that was the, the line where they stopped. And uh, we have spent first eight days in that location, uh, doing night shifts, uh, hearing all the artillery, all the gunfights, uh, preparing the water, food. Logistics, medicine. Uh, I was always holding my gun with me. Uh, and then on the eighth day, uh, when the situation seemed like desperately bad.
bad. Uh, my dad showed up and said, like, uh, I'm going to... I'm taking a 24-hour shift at the local ambulance. He's a surgeon. Uh, he okay. said, I, I, will be, I will be there uh, to help with the wounded soldiers. And uh, it would be a really great favor if you can pack everything up and move out uh, until it's too late. And uh, that was a hard choice. And uh, we left the village. And uh, since then, we were not at home. We lived in different locations across Ukraine. We ended up in the Carpathian Mountains at a very lovely place. Uh, but we just were displaced. But we moved away from the front line. Uh, yeah, while my dad spent uh, a lot of time in the ambulance. And every time I was calling him, he was saying like, oh, no, we don't have... Any wounded people, they are going into hospitals. We are just chilling there. And then I, I saw a recording from the local TV showing like yeah. <laughs> their ambulance. And they said they uh, they served more than 90 wounded soldiers uh, in the first months of war. Yeah, so that place was hot. And we were really lucky to move out in time. Uh, yeah. I mean, what was it like being one one day, here you are, you know, just kind of living your life, you know, <laughs> and, and then the next day, you know, <laughs> you're, you're defending yourself, right? Like, it, I don't think anybody could have imagined, especially as crazily as, as this whole thing, you know, with the, the whole like, hey, we're doing exercises, and then they invade. I mean, like, that, that, talk about a weird sneak attack. And, and you know, uh, so I don't think the world was ready for what happened, let alone Ukraine, right? I, I, I think we were all completely befuddled by it. So, but what, what was it like to live it for, for you? Uh, it was a, you know, uh, it's was a situation when you are uh, on adrenaline. Uh, yeah. You are really shocked and ever since seems like in a, uh, a tunnel and you can only see something in front of you and you are disoriented completely uh, and uh, we were like doom scrolling through all the news and uh, the most like intense part was uh, so for instance the first day uh, our village is called Bilogorodka uh it's like probably 10 miles away from the hostel airport uh where russians tried to make like a, a base to land more marines and then go over the Kiev. and uh at the first day like we heard all the shellings uh toward that place and then like immediately you see okay so we like ukrainian uh news channels moved on telegram saying yeah we have successfully bombed the location and they won't be able to land their planes then in an hour uh, no they they are actually 30 russian uh planes with airborne soldiers are still flying towards ukraine so probably they can land uh panic continues and then like we hear a plane flying flying really at a very low altitude then we hear some bomb or rocket, uh, house shakes really hard. And uh, in 15 minutes, we read, okay, now airport is completely destroyed and they won't be able to land there. So, you know, li like in the real time, you you see everything happening and uh, that was really hard to to navigate yourself in this situation, what was really going on. And... Uh, uh, yeah, when they that cut was... down the communication and, you know, like how, I mean, it was hard to, to know what was going on. I think we had probably a better grip on what was going on than most of the Ukrainians. And, you know, uh, we're watching from the outside. So, uh, in, in fact, they they were not able to effectively cut down all the communications. And that was probably their biggest mistake because people still uh, continue communicating and uh, the Internet was working. And uh, that's why at least some coordination helped to stand the ground. 
and uh, to form the territorial defense uh, unit. And you know, when people, uh, the government just uh, gave uh, AK 47s to everybody who yeah, wanted, they did, uh, but that really helped because uh, you know, it's an easy walk when you can just enter the city, but it's definitely not an easy walk when uh, some grandpa, granddad who was shooting Nazis 70 years ago now has an AK-47 and he definitely won't... uh, He's not going anywhere. Uh, Yeah, he's not going anywhere. He's going to do that. And like in our house, uh, we have agreed that the moment they enter the yard, we will be shooting back. Uh, Otherwise, like... uh, like we are not professionals who would go in fields and do some guerrilla warfare there, but we had a right. straight decision making line. Like if they enter, we we are shooting back. Yeah, yeah. The resolve of the Ukrainian people really impressed me. You know, the people that had never carried weapons before, your retired military. You know. Uh, yeah, just, it blew me away. I mean, you've got kids uh, that, you know, teenagers that were sticking around to be like, Hey, this is where I live. You're not going to come in here and, you know, terrorize us. Um, and I, I just was blown away by, first of all, the fact that it happened, but second of all, just the resolve of the people to, to say, you know what, we're going to stand up and, you know, I, I, it's a terrible situation. But uh, yes, I'm just uh, again, I'm impressed with with it, you know uh, how you uh, stood you up know, it, <laughs> and did something it, about it it. It, it. it probably was also a surprise for Ukrainians that we will stand up, that we will unite, and there was an uplift uh, and the notion that uh, it's like the beginning of the new history for Ukraine, where we are now one new nation and uh, nobody has any rights to do something to Ukraine. Like my employees from Kharkiv, uh, the most Russian speaking city in Ukraine, uh, and probably it was the most pro-Russian city uh, of all. Uh, now they only speak Ukrainian and they, they are the most radical anti-Russian people you can ever meet. You know, so the swing really was huge and now uh, definitely invaders uh, achieve the completely different result they were expecting to achieve. Yeah. Oh, well, I was sad to see so many of those young soldiers, even on the Russian side, that didn't want to be there. You know, they, they weren't for it. They were almost surprised, a lot of them. Um, and still, the Ukrainian people, I know they were fighting for their lives, but they were actually, they treated a lot of those people those young kids with a lot of dignity and respect. I mean, I saw some things that just blew my mind. Hey, I just, I've been away from home for a month. Can I call my mom and dad? I didn't, I didn't know I was coming here sort of stuff, you know, uh, just blew my mind. Um, you know, grandmother standing in front of tanks and saying no, <laughs> right? Like that's, that's something special. Uh, man, what a crazy experience. Like, so, you know, what, what's going on for your family right now there? Uh, so they, they are now staying there. Uh, I, I'm from yep. a medical dynasty, so everybody in my family is now doing their best on the medical side. and uh, All the hospitals are helping with the wounded soldiers, uh, like, no matter the specialization. Uh, right now, the situation is quite... Uh, more challenging so what's last what started uh last monday uh was a huge surprise so i remember so uh like two two weeks ago uh we visited investors and friends in la and uh, on friday we went to a, to a birthday party and uh, we showed up there a little bit too late and i saw all the people are so celebrating that much and that's happening in LA all of them are mo- mostly all of them are Ukrainians and uh, I've been asked like uh, so you're partying that much like uh, what the reason what what's happening they said like the Crimean bridge is down so we have a great uh, case to celebrate and that was the up and then like in three days on Monday uh, I'm just 
perceiving news and seeing messages from my friends where they are figuring out where they're going to stay, how they're now in bomb shelters, because they're just throwing all the missiles and all the drones or civilian objects. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, so, you know, the mood swing is really hard. And for people who are there, it's now really challenging. They uh, they they are preparing for power outages. They are preparing for uh, lack of heat, and uh, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I don't know. It's it's definitely not right that they are targeting the civilian infrastructure right now, mm. and they are not. They're definitely not respecting any laws at all, like laws of war. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 horrible. So, like, if you were to say, "Hey, what what can the world do? What can business owners do? Founders, you know, people who are of means? What what can we do to help the Ukrainian people?" So uh, that's a good question. And uh, this week was the week of Tech Crunch disrupt in San Francisco, and we had a big Ukrainian delegation uh, running events, uh, spreading the word, uh, like learning. Uh, yeah, Ukrainian. the war is not over. I, I know a lot of people have forgotten about it, but it's it's not over. Uh, I don't think that people already forgotten about it. Uh, but and actually, I was afraid that the West will get tired of this war too soon. Now it seems like the support is indefinite and uh, mm-hmm. undoubtful. But really, we need. Uh, Ordinary people to know like what's going on. We, we really need ordinary people to keep uh, being like updated. They they should know that those are not like pro-Ukrainian Nazis fighting for Ukraine. Those are like ordinary people, like engineers from IT companies who are who were apolitical at all, business owners. Some definitely not uh, some mad Nazis as Russian propaganda is now trying to. Uh, draw it. Uh, we, we need people to stay in the loop, and I really hope that the world won't get tired of the situation because then Ukraine is done, and uh, all all the casualties, all the lost lives were for nothing. So, and I really hope that both institutions and ordinary people will keep supporting us, and uh, like the bullshit, like. The well, the thing that Elon Musk posted recently is not what uh, the world is expecting from Ukraine. Well, thank you for sharing that. Uh, I think we can all do something, whatever it is, and um, you know, to to stay informed is is I think the smallest thing to make sure that you know they don't get away with what they've done there. Um, and then it doesn't it doesn't lay down that that Ukraine and the world doesn't lay down quietly to the injustice that has happened um, and the war crimes. I mean, that's because that's really what's happening. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. But, uh, people should just recognize that this is a situation with a school bully. So unless you hit back, uh, no matter how hard, uh, it will just keep getting worse. So uh, and Ukraine is now doing the dirty job for the rest of the world uh, hitting the autocratic bully back and uh, hopefully Taiwan won't be the next spot where uh, with a situation like that in Ukraine so yeah, yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd but heard we, that too but we, we are really optimistic and uh, like right now there is not a single chance like that Ukrainian population will give up because of the dam bombing out all the electrical stations, etc. Uh, people are getting more radicalized and, uh, you know, software engineers uh, who are saying like, okay, if they turn down all the electricity and I won't be able to code anymore, I will grab a gun and go to the front line. So it's definitely the vibe right now in ukraine yeah as they try to take more and more away you know they're they're getting more and more resistance yeah that makes all the sense in the world um 
Well, thank you for sharing that with me. You know, I, I think your story is really powerful. You know, there's, there's, there's so much going on over there that needs to, to be heard. And, you know, your story, I think, is really impactful. Um, not just to the people who are, you know, have made it outside of the, the country, but the people who are still fighting there, your family, you know, your, uh, your people. Uh, I, I, you know, I do pray that they continue to do that uh, and that we continue to help uh, as best as we can. Uh, as a business, uh, as a business, so three things that we made to support Ukraine. So first of all, we have conducted a fundraiser event uh, okay. with the Met- with the Meta History Project, and uh, we helped raise almost one and a half million dollars for Ukraine. Wow! Uh, it was a virtual fundraiser, virtual NFT auction, and that helped to raise a lot of money. Uh, that what we did, the best what we could do at the product company. The second thing that we kept hiring, and we hired uh, even like thirteen, uh, yeah, thirteen people uh, since the beginning of war. Most of them are Ukrainian engineers uh, who are either in Ukraine or now all across Europe. So. We are really hiring a lot of people and we will keep hiring more and more. And, you know, like Ukrainian engineers are really top talent. So uh, it's great for us, the ability to hire people of the top quality. And we also keep supporting them, their families. So uh, it helps to pay more taxes. And uh, the third thing that we had three developers in Russia and Mm -hmm. uh, all of them, said uh like we, we we are not supporting russia we want to relocate as soon as possible and we help them to leave russia so they also we also did some direct economical damage to russia uh wow. by relocating those people wow that's that's incredible man that's a that's a good top three uh and all of those i think made made a difference um thanks for sharing that so there's there's really so much that you could be sharing today. And I, I'm, I'm curious, you know, that was a lot of real world stuff. And, you know, I think a lot of people have questions about what, what is the metaverse. And, you know, my, one of my questions and thoughts for you was, you know, as a founder in the industry, like what, what gets you excited about the metaverse? Like what, what doors do you think that opens, um, you know, both in, in, the, in the metaverse, but also in the real world? real world <laughs> uh, so that's a very good question and uh, like there is a lot of buzz around metaverse and uh, i even feel a little bit ashamed to say here like on TechFront that we are a b2b metaverse events platform because for those who don't know what what is behind that they say oh yeah another metaverse company please uh don't waste my time but uh, for us, this was a like, evolutionary process. So we started in May 2020. Uh, and uh, the idea was to gamify the idea chats, to make social events, social calls, like less boring. Uh, and we were really lucky to close the first big deal with the leading music streaming company. The name is under the NDE. But they wanted to celebrate the five thousand uh, the part like to hold the party for five thousand employees virtually, and uh, it was the end of year party. And they said like we're gonna have a really top tier music stars uh, performing, but the platform is still Zoom. Uh, if you uh. can come up with something uh. better than Zoom. That would probably be a good fit for us. And uh, we we said, okay, we we are like, we almost have the product that you need. It would take us uh, a little bit of time to polish that. Uh, give us some time and we will deliver. Then we immediately hired six people. Like some of them kept working uh, after their day, day jobs and over the weekends to deliver that. And uh, we created the 3D environment right in the browser. So no headsets, no other applications. Uh, it's immersive. It's photorealistic. 
And the most important, it combines the this 3D with traditional video communication. Uh, because we clearly saw that avatars are cool, but they are not expressing emotions at all or good right. enough. And during corporate parties, during meaningful discussions, uh, you need to see other people's faces. Uh, Just like this, man. Just like you and me, right? <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, also there is a huge like uh, point on like where the Zoom fatigue is coming from, but let's tie that later. And uh, this combination of 3D, video communication, great content, games, and activities, so it was really interactive, uh, helped us to deliver the record uh, hidden event with the average session length of 132 minutes. So, you know, uh, employees spending more than two hours together online uh, seemed like a huge win, especially considering that Zoom social events are as lame as you could imagine, and probably all of us tried that once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I've I've done enough uh, Zoom meetings to uh, to kill a horse, uh, and I agree that they're they're they are fatiguing. They're not, you know, they're they're energy stealing. They're not energy giving. And so, like, you know, talk about what's different about your platform. Talk about like what you want people to hear about it and like why why you even went that direction it sounds like you had an immediate need but like where are you taking it oh yeah that, that's a great question so first of all uh there is a research uh saying that the first biggest cause of zoom fatigue uh is that while the call uh you are mostly looking at yourself not at the other person and uh, right you know, uh, I I think like for millions and millions of years, uh, we saw ourselves hardly at all. At all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, all, I don't know, maybe in some water, but probably th that wasn't that often. And uh, your brain is probably not ready for seeing yourself for that long. Five, seven especially, hours. Especially, especially in the morning. Especially in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and uh, this indefinite loop of self uh, doubt, I don't know, seeing yourself is uh, making you feel bad. And they, they made it by eye tracking software. And they saw that even if you are trying to look at the other person or in camera, you are still constantly sliding your glance towards your picture. And uh, in party space, when it's a 3D environment, your video is not in the center. It's really somewhere on the peripheral uh, vision. You are forced uh, to see the environment in other people's streams. And this makes it a huge difference. Also, uh, this 3D picture creates this in-depth of the picture. and People say, like, we feel like we are there, not here. It's not a VR, but still it works well enough to create the, the illusion of presence. And okay. uh, we saw that when we brought some celebrities and they entered, like, the area. And then we asked visitors about how they felt. They said, like, oh, I felt like I was in the same room with the celebrity. And that's how I told about it to other people. So, uh, so yes, we, we are tricking people into believing they are in some virtual destination without VR, without headsets, without any drugs, drugs or anything else. That's fantastic. It's, it's very interesting to hear that. Um, so like, you know, one of the things you mentioned to me when we first talked is, you know, one of the barriers to, well, there's several barriers for the average person, you know, to, to actually interact on this level. And one of which you said was, you know, the VR headsets, right? The other one you said was the nausea. And so I think you're solving two things with that. What, what is the, the next thing? Like if we were to evolve from where you're at right now, like what, what do you got on your roadmap that, um, you know, is, is reasonably in the future? Mm, that that's uh, in fact the challenge the, the, the most important challenge we have right now is to productize what we created because mm -hmm. experiences are uh, 
they're full of those like you know very thin lines uh whenever you cross it then the magic is not happening like for instance sure. du- during the social uh, the, the internal conference for a huge trucking company scania our organizers wanted us to seat all the visitors to a designated places and uh, people were wandering around they were exploring the space uh, we saw them having a lot of fun of them but then at some point we pressed the button and all of them were uh <laughs> in their, their spot chair yeah and after <laughs> that even despite being allowed to to move they people sat there and uh i don't know whether that was the idea behind that from the organizers but in my opinion like uh when people are wandering around they do different social connections they interact with the environment some uh materials is much better than uh just a statical environment so uh there are a lot of things like that that we are exploring that we are figuring out and we are now like making this as a self service product but we don't want people to make those mistakes uh, some were making with the experiences uh the second thing that like our technology uh has a lot of different use cases and uh, the basic approach is that if uh the social experience for this particular reason would work better than the lonely experience then party space is a good fit for your uh business and uh, we are now figuring out in which spheres social activities would beat the traditional lonely experiences like we haven't experimented enough with e-commerce uh we haven't experimented enough with front offices we have just created the first virtual office virtual meeting room environment so there are a lot of experiments uh but we clearly know that we can help remote teams to stay more connected and this is the huge market itself and uh this is the first the beach head market for party space so and maybe it's a little premature but like what kind of feedback or metrics have you been able to pull out of these experiences when you compare it to say a zoom like meeting or or webinar conference that we we all have kind of learned to uh you know get used to mm-hmm. yeah that that's a good question so uh first of all uh in our environment we have a lot more data points on what people are doing they can interact okay. we can actually see which direction they were looking what kind of content they were uh seeing so a lot of more data and uh to to have a comprehensive analytics system we are now working with the uh, professional hrs and uh our, our partners the ex chief editor for hr.com david krilman and uh, mike he used to be the hr advisor to board of bank of america and uh, they help us to build this system which would give the data which uh, could help like people's managers to know a little bit more on their behavior and patterns of employees during social gatherings uh but what really we know for now that the average session length is where we are uh out competing all other platforms like uh five times more uh on if comparing to zoom and three to two times more than other more gamified experiences than zoom so we are in the top tier of the engagement of users and also we know that in party space uh like typically during the event more than 80% of all visitors are actively mm-hmm. uh interacting with others uh and i think it's more not about party space but it's more about the pattern how people behave during events so at least one fifth of all visitors are lurkers and they just want to stay in some quiet place and uh just to follow the show without really interacting with others yeah our introverted friends which there's no wrong with that it's just that's the way they take in things so uh i i agree so i i'm curious so it's 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 primarily a b2b platform right you've talked a lot about events but it's called party space and so yeah, I, I have to ask, where did the name come from? Uh, this was just the beginning. And uh, we, we 
we're thinking we will build something for parties and uh-huh. uh, that was the first thing we came up with and uh, it really helped us because it's so much easier to sell a b2b software uh like to enter the deal when you start selling party space because okay a party space something for parties let's send it off and <laughs> that would work but now when party space is being used for team buildings for master classes for workshops so we we are now starting working with uh 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 with the university of berkeley and okay. uh and maybe party space is not the best fit for you know <laughs> for, for seminars and workshops there so we, we will probably create a new sub brand with more business attitude there yeah well no I, it's not necessarily a bad thing because you know you think about corporate events and you know a lot of times i mean i've been to a number of them and you know they have I, I find it somewhat odd. Sometimes they have like a dance party there. You know, it's not my, di- my my cup of tea. But, you know, for some people, they're out there on the dance floor. They're having a good time, and that's for them. And, you know, I think for party party space uh, or if you come up with some sort of sub-brand, you know, um, you mentioned g- kind of gamifying it, right, and, and making it more interesting than, than other things. So I, when I think of that, I think of like, um, is it Cahoots? Is is that one of the the kind of gamification platforms? I've seen that come up a few times. That can be a lot of fun. Kind of rem- reminds me of uh, if you've ever played Jackbox, <laughs> right? On uh, yeah. on any system where everybody can kind of chime in and uh, you know answer the questions or get surveys or things like that. So kind of take me along the gamification side of things. Like what what are you what are you doing right now? And then like w- you know what potentially things are you looking to do? So uh, we started uh, seeing what Kahoot is doing and uh, also knowing Jackbox games. So that that was like the initial point of reference for us. But now we see that uh, in our case, uh, we built that platform, the platform where people could use Kahoot inside there, okay. where people could use Jackbox games inside. And that is much better uh excuse me, a much better way to play those games on party space than on Zoom. Because we have a more natural breakout experience. And during right. such games, uh, especially when you're doing a competition between teams, not an in, like, individual yep. game, uh, this works much better. So party space, like uh, I hate when people are comparing that and saying it's a 3D Zoom. Uh, it's, it really lowers the... Act- expectations and we have a bigger picture behind that so we are building the engine for social interactions online and uh, jackbook games kahoot uh i don't know a poker table karaoke game everything will be on party space and that would be like the mean of choice for somebody who's in charge of running the event so are you going to do online casinos right? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> uh, not casinos. Uh, poker. <laughs> it's not a casino. Yeah, poker. And, uh, so, uh, but we, uh, actually, uh, some companies said, like especially smaller tech companies, they said that they are uh, they were playing poker offline in person uh, before COVID started, and they'd love to have the virtual poker corporate club. Uh, yeah. For them, uh, because that was a great way for you know it's an intellectual game, so it could be a chess club, but I think poker club would be a little bit more popular within uh, companies like that. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, poker is you know kind of came raging back about ten years ago, and it's kind of fallen off a little bit again, but it's uh, probably a little more popular than than chess these days. <laughs> just to be honest. Uh, but you could probably have both. I mean, how difficult, I mean, if you're playing a game, right, how difficult would it be to to, to do chess or backgammon or, I mean, what, bocce ball, if that's what you want to do. Uh, so uh, right now we have very basic games and uh, yeah. the biggest challenge we are facing is that uh, we need party space to be accessible from the lower spec computers without downloading any software. And when you are running your software in the browser it's really hard resource wise so uh right now we are optimized well for macbook air from 2015 or so uh and to add like a 
better quality games, we also will have to optimize Everton good enough. But Party Space is very flexible in terms of uh, integrations, and uh, you can insert your activities in Party Space, or you can take Party Space and integrate it in your platform. And uh, really? we are now, yes, and uh, that's what we are now doing with two major platforms. Uh, one is the largest virtual events platform, and I don't know whether I am allowed to say that loud, but uh, I should probably you don't have not to. call their name. <laughs> yeah, and the second is the like video communication software company, uh, which serves ninety percent of all Fortune five hundred clients, and okay. we are integrating party space in their solutions. So then it would be like a the really the best user journey. You just press open party space and you have party space in your corporate software ready to go. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the integrations is the kind of the, the wave of the future. How many systems, you know, I, I, I did notice that you had like Zapier on, on your list, um, you know, of companies and uh, Grammarly and, you know, those integrate with a lot of different, si- obviously Zapier like integrates with everything. right? <laughs> so, you know, the, the, that's a good place to, to kind of start, but you know, what, what's kind of the, the, you know, from a technology standpoint, you, you, you mentioned you're kind of focusing on the HR seat a little bit right now because they're trying to bring, you know, in this flexible work environment, this remote work environment that really, let's just argue that it's global. I mean, you're a global company, right? You got people everywhere. You know, it. how do you pull people together? And the HR you know, department usually is kind of responsible for that. So if you were speaking to HR departments and, and you know that I'm already in the in the space, I'm in HR tech and, and benefits, right? Um, what would you say to them? What would you say, hey, this is why you should consider using party space to you know, bring your people together? And, and be, because here are the, the, the top outcomes you, you could expect from that. Uh, that's a great question. So last year, uh, both us and our investors, we were quite afraid that remote work won't uh, be a thing. And we saw like a small decline in interest. And we saw that people were turning back to offices. They were pro offline parties. And the biggest challenge we had was like to educate people that okay, remote work, social events are fine. You gotta be doing that. Now, when people are like almost three years away from global pandemics, uh, it's definitely a new normal. And even team leaders who uh, who has like at least one remote working employee, they have to invest in social activities which are accessible by everyone, including the remote person. Otherwise, first of all, they are discriminating that person. And second, they will just lose that person really soon because that person won't be integrated in the culture. So uh, right now, remote uh, social activities for remote workers are like, it's a must-have solution. And uh, now we only have to compete with other platforms. And in nine of 10 cases, uh, HRs are considering using Zoom. And it's not a problem at all (laughs) showing you how we we are beating Zoom events. When it gets to other players who are trying to make events more fun, uh, the majority of competitors, they are either in VR space and there are not enough VR headsets uh, on the market, or they have created 2D platforms, uh, you know, with some more gamification, more fun, like, I don't know, Gather Down, Gremo, uh, Topia, whatever. These platforms are cool, and they, they're doing their job. But we saw that without the 3D environment, people are still treating them as yet another Zoom call. While when it's in 3D environment, the magic is happening and uh, people are leaving quite different feedback there. So uh, for now, it's not just the matter of uh, proving we we have the best solution. It's now just the matter of educating the market why, how, and uh, in which capacity they should use party space. Because we clearly, we don't want people to use party space for daily meetings like one-to-one like zoom is doing that well uh but but when it's in meeting with a social component and uh 
uh, you need people to be more flexible where you mm-hmm. they they you want them to create groups on their own and uh, you want them to feel the real presence there then party space is the way to go yeah so you know one of the things i'm i'm a true believer in um and i think you know often enough we don't see it you know how do you eat your own dog food and if you don't know what that means like how do yeah. you use party space for party space <laughs> yes uh party space is the the thing that we are using internally for almost all the types of meetings uh which has a social component and we have a lot of meetings with a social component because that's that's our dog food and uh all the town hall meetings, all the Friday after works, internal parties, celebrations, everything is happening online. Uh, and uh, we have created some crazy spaces that are definitely not something we can sell <laughs> uh, to other people because they were created <laughs> internally around, you know, internal memes. But we really <laughs> feel like it's something. Uh, so I think the soul of party space exists in parties is in some of these meme inspired party space locations yeah i did read i read something on uh on the website or on your profile about some sort of meme party or something like that that you you, you guys had um i think the the possibilities are really limitless of, of what you can do um I, I will ask, so like for, for somebody who's kind of dipping their toe in the water, you mentioned trucking company. That one actually really surprised me, that a trucking company would be interested in something uh, like they, this. They actually have a manufacturer of trucks. Oh, okay. So like, okay, yep. a manufacturer of trucks. Uh, are we talking like uh, like semi-trucks or? No, no, it's a European company that is mostly producing okay. huge trucks. Yep. No, okay. They have like tens of thousands of employees. Okay. Yeah. That surprises me, to be honest with you. I I feel like in in many cases, the automotive industry is a little bit behind on on something. So, you know, thumbs up that, you know, they're trying to innovate and and be interesting at the forefront. But like, what would you say to somebody who's like, ah, our people wouldn't be interested in that because, you know, and like, whatever, like, uh, we're not a tech company. We're not, you know, whatever. But those exist. But what would you say to them? Uh, okay, so yeah, those deniers, they always exist. And uh, pro- probably like in our case, uh, what we saw that people from the least technically sophisticated areas, uh, and I'm not trying to insult them, but lawyers, uh, you know, they're they are very yeah. traditional. And uh, when we host A lot of paper. parties yeah, for law firms, uh, for them, it was the mind-blowing experience so it's hard to impress an average person from zapier or grammarly but when it comes to a lawyer and the lawyer sees the opportunity to shoot emoji in his boss oh my god <laughs> it, it really uh so i i think maybe we will have even a little bit more traction with those who are skeptical just because we impress them so much more and actually, the first virtual office, the the first virtual office, which was created with a professional architect bureau, uh, was created for a law firm from Ukraine. And they said, like, we used to be running a lot of events. We were inviting people from over the world to Ukraine. Now we are doing that online. And uh, that's why we created this office that looks like it's on the top of Carpathian Mountains. So it still has the Ukrainian identics, some Ukrainian vibe, archi- uh, some statues and carpets from Ukraine, but it's a futuristic office for a law firm. See, it's for everybody. That's what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, I, I so much appreciate you, you coming on here. Uh, I always like to cap off the show cause you've shared so many interesting things with us, but I always like to cap it off with, you know, like, Hey, if you were giving advice to somebody and look, you, you've got a unique story where you come from, what you've been through, but if you were giving, uh, advice to like a founder, maybe someone back home where, you know, in, um, in Ukraine, like, what would you say? If they were trying to build a company, like trying to do something new, like what you're doing, what are three things that you would tell them, hey, you need to be focused on, on this to do this well? 
maybe you know bumps and bruises you've gotten along the way and then what's one thing that they shouldn't do um this this could be a, a list of things or just mindset type things okay so the third thing like don't be afraid uh Love nobody that. cares if you fail nobody cares at all and uh if you fail that that's even good for you and that's a that's good for humanity we need a lot of people failing trying to do new stuff that that's what pushing their boundaries so don't be afraid uh, and don't be afraid to fail uh the second thing is to be bold like uh i saw a lot of really talented people who are not bold enough to make some change and uh they, they just need to be to believe in themselves a little bit more uh just be bold so uh also like uh so always the, okay that was the first point be bold the second would be always focus on your customer so uh think uh of their uh always try to have their perspective and uh, as soon as you have it try to validate that in conversation so if you have some ideas and uh, the idea is not validated you it's all like you always have to put that idea in a very harsh conditions you need to face reality so when you dream big and you make those ideas into real world then then you really start moving forward in a proper way and the third advice would be to uh don't forget that it's a marathon not a sprint. Uh Good advice. I made a lot of mistakes like forcing myself to achieve some results too harsh and uh, after that I was completely destroyed for weeks and uh in total the payoff was much lower than if would I have kept the pace and uh balanced out like my personal things my health my work so think of this as a marathon and uh then you will go further yeah all all great advice and you're right man this has been a, a really kind of an emotional roller coaster for me to hear your story and then uh and then for us to jump into the metaverse together this is really cool man thanks thanks for coming on the show i always like to ask uh j just as a follow-up you know if if people wanted to learn more about this uh you know chat with you follow you or ping you or or just plain annoy you where would they find you like what's the best place to connect okay so the best place to find more about party space is on party.space so that's the name of the company and the domain for us uh and for me, it would be better to connect on LinkedIn, and uh, I'm running a newsletter, uh, Metaverse Behind the Bus. Uh, now having more than one hundred and uh, one and a half thousand, one and a half thousand subscribers interested in this topic. So please join the newsletter and then write me directly uh, with any questions you have. Uh, I'd love to help you. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, if you liked the, the conversation, you liked where it went, you liked uh, Yuri's story, make sure you boot the like button, subscribe to What the Tech. Uh, we're going to have lots of other amazing people on the show. Uh, and so excited uh, for what you're doing, man. I, I think, you know, and I wish you the very best. Uh, it sounds like, you know, the sky's really the limit for you. Um, so get after it, my man. <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Thank you. I really appreciate that.